us closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Oh, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. You can clap your hands, come on. I am weak, but thou art strong. Come on, join with me. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long. Oh, as I walk, let me walk close to thee. We're gonna take a walk right here. Seems like just yesterday. <laughs> Have you been? Everybody good? I talked to a few of you. I didn't hear any anything too bad. So, you know, I guess. Uh, I, you said what? Oh, you weren't talking to me. Sorry. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we're gonna sing some songs this morning. We're gonna praise the Lord. I hope you're ready. That was good singing for a start. All right. I think you know this next song, so we're gonna get right into that. You know, everything would be better if we had a closer walk with him, would it not? That's our goal. A closer walk with Jesus. And if we have a closer walk, that's the only way we'll be able to sing this song.
day when my faith shall be sad and the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. some announcements that was next oh we're gonna turn and greet uh see I, I forget so easily right let's turn and say hi to somebody sitting around you okay good morning Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Uh, welcome to Crossroads Church of Dunwoody. My name is Erin and I'm a volunteer here. We are so thrilled that you guys have joined us for service this morning. If you are a first time guest with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, we are glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. Uh, we do have a gift for you in the back on your way out. There will be somebody in the back of the sanctuary there uh, to greet you and to get a little more information about who you are. Uh, we'd love to get to know you better and uh, we invite you to come back next week as well. Uh, one quick announcement that I do have, uh, next Sunday, September 30th, after our worship service, is our CCA Day. Uh, Crossroads Christian Academy has been a part of uh, this church's min uh, ministry for the last 51 years, and so we invite you guys to celebrate with us uh, that legacy uh, next Sunday after the worship service. Um, Oh, sorry, pastor's making hand signals, and I'm trying to figure out what he's saying. He's not talking to me. <laughs> um, 
Anyways, so we do invite you to come out and celebrate those 51 years with CCA next Sunday afternoon. Uh, there are a couple of other announcements in the bulletin, so make sure you grab one on your way out today. Um, there's a men's retreat and another men's conference and a Bible study. So lots of really cool things happening here at Crossroads. Make sure you grab that info on the way out. And we do have a scripture reading this morning from a very well-known passage and one of my favorites from Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this time that we have to gather together to worship you this morning. Uh, we thank you for uh, the sending of your son and then um, just the gift that he gave us by coming to live a perfect and sinless life and then to die on the cross and then not to stay dead but to rise again and to go to your right hand. Uh, Father, and, and we thank you that we have that gift. Um, we ask that you will be with us this morning as we worship, be in our service, and be with um, everybody this morning. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Sorry about the hand signals. I was trying to find out if we qualified as first time so we could get this sandwich. He didn't answer me. Do we? Are we good? Thank you. All right. Not only do we have a savior, we have a shepherd. He came to set us free from our sin and the bondage that goes with that. But he also came to guide us through this life till we get to the next life with him, right? So let's celebrate that this morning. Why don't you stand and sing? The Lord my portion I shall not want The Lord my comfort I shall not fear Yea, though I walk through the valley alone Yea, though the path gets steep, surely goodness will follow me. Every promise will be like to my feet when my heart is prone to wandering. Jesus, you share. Secure. The Lord, my healer, your love endures. Yea, though I walk through the valley low, yea, though the path gets steep, surely goodness will follow. you 
do we really, do we understand how great his love is for us? Do we really? I mean, sometimes life is okay. It's going pretty well, you know? Nothing's wrong, nothing. We're coasting along. And then uh, get a phone call or, you know, something that just changes everything, right? Let's don't wait until that happens before we realize and we recognize how great is his love for us. Without his love, we would all be doomed. We would all be lost forever. So if nothing else, that's, that's reason to celebrate. That's reason to praise him. This life is short. Sometimes we get a reminder of that. Hopefully not today, right? But we can praise him anyway.
to lift up our praise this morning. Nothing but Jesus. All right, you may be seated. Thank you very much. Uh, hey, if you've got your Bible, would you open with me to 2 Kings chapter 22? This is page, I looked it up, 329 in the Red Bible, uh, if you don't have one with you. And just kind of leave a marker there because that's where we're going to be most of this message. Uh, for the last two months now, we have been working through a series called I Will. And last week, Pastor Chris did an awesome job of unpacking trusting in the gospel and what the gospel is. And I just want to do a little bit of, of recap, because one of the most important points I took out of that is this idea that God is the gospel. Now, what does the word gospel mean? Gospel, it just comes from a Greek word that means good news. So if we say God is the gospel, we're saying God is the good news. God is the ultimate. God is the greatest thing in this world. God is ultimately what the desire, the deepest desire of our hearts is. I've heard it said that there's this God-shaped hole inside of each of us. And we're going to spend most of our lives trying to fill that hole with something until we come into relationship with the living God, the only thing that can fill this hole. And now if God is the good news, that means that there has to be some kind of bad news. And, and here's the bad news. The bad news is that from the time of Adam and Eve, mankind, and all of us along with them, we have chosen to do what we think is best. And we have said to God, no, you know, what you have is, is great and all, but, but we know what's best for us. Remember the story of Adam and Eve, that old story, where God says, I'm giving you this great creation, everything that you could ever want, but do not eat of this one tree. And the deceiver comes to them and says what? He says, oh, did God say to you, you shouldn't eat of this one tree? Well, you know that this is actually the one thing you do need. And, and from that time, we have thought we know What's better? And it's this thing called sin. It's, it's self-glorification. I try to describe to my students in my classes, why is sin so grievous? And, and the best way I've, I've come across showing this is, I say, look, if you turn next to your classmate and you go smack, smack him in the face, uh, you're going to get in trouble. It's not going to be a good thing. But listen, if you come up to the front of the classroom and you say, Mr. St. James, I have a question. Smack, you smack me in the face. It's going to be worse, right? And if you go into the cafeteria and the headmaster is walking through the cafeteria with his plate of meaty pasta, and you come up from under that plate and smack it up into his face, you're probably going to get expelled. It's worse. Let's take it a step further. Maybe you, uh, you're on a vacation to London, and the queen is coming. She's shaking hands, kissing babies. And you go to shake her hand, but instead, smack. It's not going to be good. Now, I want to I propose to you that the God of the universe is infinitely more valuable than even the queen of England. See, sometimes the wrongness of something that you do can be measured by the thing you're offending. And so even the smallest sin in the world against the Queen of England, who is, uh, I don't know, probably one of the most valuable people in, in the world's standards, even the smallest offense, the biggest offense against her, doesn't measure up to the smallest offense against a holy God, a holy, perfect God. And so the bad news is that we've all sinned, right? We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And I don't think that I need to stand up here and, and hammer that home to you. Not everybody in my class 
at school as a Christian, I don't have to hammer home to them the idea that, yeah, sometimes we do things that we shouldn't do. And when we do those things, it separates us from a holy God who's so holy that he, he can't be in the presence of unholiness. But here's the good news we talked about last week is that Jesus takes on flesh. He becomes man, and he does what man had to do. From the beginning, God gives his dominion mandate. He says, go, be my holy people and spread my holy place everywhere. And we fail over and over and over and over again. And he extends grace over and over and over and over again. But humankind in Jesus, he's finally fully perfecting this. He's finally fully fulfilling the law, doing everything that we were told we had to do. He does what man has to do, but then he does what only God could do. Because God is a just judge, and a just judge judges justly. And so the just judgment here is that there, there has to be some kind of punishment for the sin of the world. But Jesus does what only God can do in taking all that punishment upon himself and forgiving all of it. So that, not just so that you individual can be saved and go to heaven, but so that we can be in the presence of the greatest thing anywhere. So that the hole inside of our heart can and will be filled through Jesus. So God is the good news. God is the gospel. God is the end that we're all going towards. Not that we're going to be God, but to be with God, to be absorbed in the worship of, of his glorious grace. This week, we're going to kind of land the plane, and we're going to take it a step further. If all of this is true, if the gospel is true, then we ought to be changed. If the gospel is true, it changes everything. So would you pray with me as we open God's word? Father, thank you that you have revealed yourself in Jesus. Thank you that Jesus, as a man, fully man, did what you called humanity to do, but Jesus, as fully God, did what only you could do. Lord, I ask that you would deeply impact us by these truths. I ask that we would leave here on fire for your gospel. So, Holy Spirit, move in us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had somebody say something to you? Or maybe on the internet, write something to you, send you a text, and you realize that this changes everything. The story we're going to get to this morning is a story where King Josiah hears something. Someone reads something to him, and it changes everything. I'm old enough to remember the beginning of social media, um, and I remember Facebook before anyone could get on Facebook. So Facebook used to be a thing where you had to be, you had to be connected to some kind of school. So it starts off with colleges, and college students could join being a part of a, a school group. Then it goes on to high schoolers, and I can remember being in middle school, and Facebook is just kind of exploding, and really looking forward to being able to start my Facebook presence, get out there on social media. And um, I was going to a new school for high school. I didn't really know anybody. My dad was a teacher there, but all my friends were going to a different high school. So my first Facebook post is going to be very important. I want to really mold who people are going to see me as. So I'm going to take you back in time and show you my very first Facebook post. We're going to see what, what is this trying to say about me. Yes, this is a picture of me dunking a basketball when I was in eighth grade. You may think, wow, Brian, that's really impressive. Brian, you're really athletic. Brian, people must love you. That's what I wanted to portray. Um, well, you're going to see. I post this, and maybe you've posted something on Facebook before, and you sit there waiting, looking for your notifications to pop up, that people are liking it, that people are loving it, that people are going to comment, Brian, you got 
And I waited and I waited and finally I get a response from a girl, a freshman girl in my class. Um, and she says, what is that, like a three foot hoop? <laughs> then one of my friends posts, ha ha, I bet I could dunk that without jumping. I didn't get a single like on this post until yesterday. I went online and I loved it. You can see up there, one love, Brian St. James. Just so I didn't feel so bad about myself when I came up this morning to show this to you. What is, uh, what is the point of that story? I don't know. Listen. We get to the story of King Josiah. Josiah didn't know any better. Josiah came from a really messed up family. By the time he comes around, his grandfather, who was a guy named Manasseh, um, had taken the temple and he had turned it into a place to worship idols. They'd gotten rid of temple worship and it was to the point where they had completely lost the word of God. They had completely lost the book of the law. Josiah's father was assassinated because he was so bad at being king. And so Josiah becomes king at eight years old. And he comes into a horrible situation where, really, you start to feel bad for Josiah because he doesn't know any better. For 57 years, his family had gone in this one direction, a horrible direction. They had lost the book of the law. And 17 years into Josiah's reign as king, they're doing a building project. Maybe some of you have been around here long enough that you remember the last building project at Crossroads, but they're doing a building project at the temple. That's where we come to in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 8. And Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan the secretary, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. Most scholars agree that the book they're talking about is Deuteronomy. That they had, they had lost this book. And actually, this was a book that they were supposed to read every year before the entire kingdom. That was one of the duties of the king of Judah. He was supposed to read this book in everyone's hearing every year. But it, remember, Manasseh, his father, his grandfather, had completely changed everything. He had made the temple a place of idol worship. There was terrible stuff going on. So they had lost this book. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king. Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have oversight of the house of the Lord. So he talks about what they had been doing, gives a good report. But then listen. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the high priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. This book was so important that they immediately go to the king and they have to share it. I don't know how many times you've read through the book of Deuteronomy. We did a study in Deuteronomy with the youth recently. But they're so excited about this book, they have to share it with the king. This is what happens when the king hears the word of God. Shaphan read it before the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Now, maybe that reference doesn't make much sense to you, but in the ancient context, ripping your clothes, tearing your clothes, was an ultimate sign of repentance and distress. King Josiah is broken to the very core of his heart over what he is reading. But the most important thing here is that he doesn't just internalize it, right? He realizes that the word is not just for him. Immediately, he's going to take that word and share it with other people. Do you remember the first time you heard the gospel? Do you remember the first time that you were broken by that good news we talked about just a few minutes ago? You know, I can remember, I grew up in a family where um, my parents would come in at the end of the night and they would pray with each of us kids. And I was at church whether I liked it or not, 
but it wasn't until I was in college that I, I felt this. I looked at relationships I had in my life. I looked at things that were most important to me. And then I waited against the gospel, the word of God. And when I read that he tore his clothes, I can feel that. I can feel the emotion there. Can you feel the emotion there? Can you remember feeling that emotion? And then after feeling that emotion, wanting to go and tell everybody about it. Let's uh, skip over to chapter 23, right at the beginning. Verse 1, and we're going to see what he goes and does. Then the king sent, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, all the people both small and great. Josiah calls who? Josiah calls everybody. Josiah doesn't just call the high priests in. He doesn't just call the wealthy people who are going to be able to help him raise money for a new temple. He calls everybody. And when Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 28, He says, go to everybody. Do you ever think that there is a type of person who is beyond saving? Do you ever think that there is a type of person who's beyond the reach and grace of God? Maybe some of you can remember the story of David Berkowitz. Not a great name, but David Berkowitz is more well known as the son of Sam Killer. And between July 1976 and 77, he committed a series of horrible where he murdered upwards of eight people in a one-year series. He was convicted to six consecutive life sentences. Well, do you think that David Berkowitz is beyond the grace and reach of God? There's a disciple of Christ, and I I don't want to give you the person's name because it doesn't matter who that person is, but there's a disciple of Christ who didn't think that David Berkowitz was beyond the reach of God. And over a series of years, he went to prison, and he visited the son of Sam Killer. And he shared with him the gospel. In 2002, David Berkowitz was offered his first parole hearing. And he's been offered a parole hearing every two years since 2002 to this day. David Berkowitz, every two years, has turned down his parole hearing, and he writes in a letter why. I have no interest in parole and no plans to seek release. If you could understand this, I'm already a free man. I'm not saying this jokingly. I really am. Jesus Christ has already pardoned me, and I believe this. I told him that I was sick and tired of doing evil. I asked Jesus to forgive me for my sins. I spent a good while on my knees seeking him. When I got up, it felt as if a very invisible chain that had been around me for so many years was broken. A peace flooded over me. I didn't understand what was happening, but in my heart, I just knew somehow my life was going to be different. David Berkowitz is able to say from inside of prison during a six consecutive life sentence that I am more free now than I ever was outside of these walls. Do you ever think that there is somebody who's beyond the reach and grace of God? I'm thinking of of a guy named Saul, Saul of Tarsus, who says, you know, I was the best of the best. I was the Jew of the Jews. I was so righteous that, that I persecuted the people who were wrong. And yet, Saul of Tarsus is reached with the gospel. Christ himself appears to him. And then a disciple comes and lays hands on him. Is there a person or a group of people who, if God said, go, share the gospel with that person, you'd not be willing to do so? I'm thinking of the story of Jonah and Nineveh, right? When God says to Jonah, go and proclaim to that city. Jonah says, nope, no thank you. 
that's not okay. I'm not happy with that, God. And we see what happens. Let's continue in the story. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people joined in the covenant. He doesn't just mentally assent to a knowledge of this thing. It says with all of his heart and with all of his soul, he was changed and he creates a covenant with the people and he says we're going to be different. Things are going to be different because this word, what you've heard, what I've heard, it changes everything. And from that point, Josiah goes around the country and he tears down the false idols. He destroys the idolaters and the idolatrous places like no king had done before. He completely changes and we see that our faith in who Jesus is, it's always married to what comes next. There's always a call out of this. It's never something that's inwardly focused alone. That's what this series has been about, right? The the outwardly focused life of a Christian. I will do these things. Now, the rest of the story is kind of sad. If you know anything about Judah's history, after this, Josiah dies. The nation turns back to its false gods. They all fall away. Judah and Jerusalem are destroyed and carried off into exile. And we see that we can't control how people are going to react when we share the gospel. Sometimes people will just walk away. Sometimes people will turn back to their old ways. But we are responsible for going. We're responsible for planting, for watering, but it's God who's going to bring the harvest, right? If we can't control, why should we even try? I want to go back to the beginning of scripture we have to start with the beginning of scripture because we have to get a context for everything else god is going to show us at the beginning of scripture his vision for the world his love for the world in genesis chapter one god creates everything he says it was good and he says let us create man in our image and he says it was very good that term up there, it says imago Dei, and it's a Latin term for the image of God. God creates mankind, male and female, in his image. If we're created in the image of God, we reflect certain things about God, right? We're creative. Our God is a creator. Now, sin has, has marred the reflection a little bit. So yes, we can, we can be loving, but our love isn't perfect like God. But what we learn is all of mankind is created in God's image. Because of that, God is everybody's father. And if God is everybody's father, he has a special love for every person on this planet who is created in his image, and that's everybody. When Jesus is asked, sum up all the law and the commandments for us. He says, all right, first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Deuteronomy 6. He says the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Out of our love for God should flow a love for everybody. Not just those people we think are worthy. Not just even for people in our own family, people who look like us, but we ought to love everybody. Every single person has an inherent born within them value and worth because they're made in God's image. They don't have that value and worth because I say they do. They don't have that value and worth because America says they do. They have that value and worth because 
God says they do. And if God values people, we ought to value people. If God loves people and, and is sending out to reach people, if God took on flesh in Jesus and went to the world to reach people and gave of his own life to reach people because he loves them, we should be doing the same thing. This is kind of where I want to park the plane. These are the last words of Jesus, and we read these earlier. Jesus has ascended into heaven, or is about to ascend into heaven. He's died, he's resurrected, he's about to ascend into heaven. He calls all of his best friends together, his disciples. And he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore. I've always learned that when you see the word, therefore, you ask, what's it there for? Well, he's referencing to everything that just happened, right? Because of who he is, because of the fact that he died, he rose from the dead, because of everything he's taught them, because Jesus is God, because God is glorious, because he loves people and he wants to reach people. Go, therefore, and make disciples. What is a disciple? It's a word that we kind of throw around, and, and maybe we don't always think so deeply about what the word disciple itself means, but a discipler is just like a follower, a student of somebody. A disciple, a disciple in the ancient context is supposed to become like an image of, of their teacher. This is how ancient education worked. They didn't have formal schools like we have today, but young people would find a teacher, and they would follow this teacher around. They would be the disciple. They would memorize, internalize the teacher's teaching, and they would become like that person, a little that person. And when we see the word Christian, it really means like a little Christ. And he says, go and make little Christs. Teach them about me. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice kind of the order here. That at baptism, we don't see the per that the people are perfect people. What we see is faith. What we see is discipleship. What we see is people becoming more like Christ. Think about your own baptism. Think about baptisms throughout Scripture. It says, repent, believe, be baptized. For those of us who are baptized in here, I, I would hope we would say that we're not perfect. We're not there yet. We're on this process called sanctification, but we haven't reached final glorification where we come before the Father. Next week, we're going to have two people in our church who are going to submit to baptism. Two people who are going to come forward, and they're going to tell their story. And listen, when you listen to their stories— understand that their story is Jesus's story. That Jesus is still alive and active in this world today through his church, through his people. Go, make disciples of all nations, of everybody. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. After that, it doesn't stop. After salvation, after baptism, the process doesn't stop. That's what many of us are doing here when we come on a Sunday morning and we sit together in a circle and we unpack scripture or we, we unpack some kind of godly teaching. We're teaching, we're learning, we're trying to, to understand better who Christ is and to be molded into his image. Make disciples, baptize them, teach them. We can't leave off. Maybe the most important part at the end here is, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. When you're going out, when you're making disciples, when you're teaching, understand that in truth, it's Christ who is in you, who's affecting any kind of work that's being done, any kind of salvation that's being done. It's Christ in you. Our youth group, we're called the 610, and it's from Ephesians 610. It says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Reiterating, be strong in the Lord and in his strength, not our own. Every God has called us to do, the power, the strength, the weight of our message is coming through him. I think um, I would be remiss if I, if I stopped here and didn't give you some practical examples and practical options 
of what we can do. So I just want to spend a, a couple minutes going over some things. One of the best places, one of the most natural places that we can enter into this process of disciple making is as parents. Now, not everyone in here is a parent. Some people in here, like my wife and I, for a long time wanted to be parents and, and we hadn't been given that blessing yet. And we're now expecting in February. And so that's exciting for me. So I'm, I'm, my mind is kind of on this. But the nuclear family is God's plan for your children. As Christ followers, as grandparents, as parents, as aunts, as uncles, God's plan is for us as believers to mold our children. Maybe some of you in here are teachers. I'm a teacher. Even if you're in a public school, we can be doing the work of spreading the gospel, of disciple-making everywhere we go. Maybe some of you are great with finances. Man, there's so many people in this community even who I'm sure could use the help of someone who's great with finances. And maybe someone comes into this church and you're able to sit down with them and, and just help them through some basic things about how to build a budget. And that person asks you, why, why are you helping me? And you can give your story. You can say, everything that I have, every talent that I have is a gracious gift that's been freely given to me by my God. And so I want to freely just give of what he's already given me and share that with you. Um, there's a young lady in here, and hopefully I won't embarrass her, but there's a young lady in here named Judy McIntyre. And I've known Miss McIntyre my whole life. Um, and she is quirky and fun. And I can remember every year at Vacation Bible School growing up that she was the first one to volunteer to go up on stage and be a fool for Jesus. To act crazy, to put on a wig, to dress up all goofy. And the kids loved it. And that's a gift that she has that she shared the gospel with. And so I'd ask you, what are some gifts that the Lord's given you? What are some ways that, that you can share the, the story of God's grace in your life? Through that story, you can share Jesus. I think all of us have these things. And I know that, that Pastor Chris or myself or any of us would, would love to speak with you about how you can plug into this church body and outside of this church body and use those gifts to share the gospel with people. No matter what our age is, no matter what our situation in life is, we are all called to go make disciples, baptize, teach them. I'm going to leave you with the words of a famous song. The song was written by a woman named Catherine Hankey. Catherine Hankey, in 1866, was dying of a horrible disease in Africa on the mission field. And Catherine Hankey wrote these words as she's sitting on the mission field, dying. I love to tell the story. It'll be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I pray that wherever we go, that would be our heart song, that you would share your story with people, and that in your story you'd be sharing Jesus, you'd be sharing the good news of the gospel, which is God himself. As I pray, the ushers are going to come forward. So would you pray with me? Father, thank you for that story. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who came and did what man could never do, and he ransomed a people to himself. Thank you, God, that our relationship with you can be made whole by the good news. Lord, 
We ask that you would help us to desire you more, that you would help us to desire to share you with others, that you would give us opportunities to do that. Thank you that we know your Holy Spirit precedes us everywhere and that you're already planning the good works for us to do, that you're there, that you're in it, that it's all from you. And God, we give you all the glory. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Good shepherd. Huh? Y'all have a great week. See you next time.